Hello, this is Mrs. Dries from the Harrison Township Public Library. Today I would like to introduce you to an illustrator of children's books. Her name is Miss Emma DeForb, and she has illustrated this book, which is titled A Search for Safe Passage. Uh, the author of this book is Frances Figure. And to, in today's presentation, Emma is going to talk to us a little bit about the important reason why this book was written and then she's going to demonstrate how she illustrated it, how she did these wonderful pictures of the animals um, using some digital drawing techniques. So we hope you enjoy and here's Emma. All right, Miss Emma, it's all yours. All right. So really quick, just a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up on the west side of the state. You can see over here on the map near Lake Michigan in a town called Grand Haven. And I went to school at Grand Valley State University, which is also on that side of the state, and I went for illustration. Um, I got my degree in 2016, and when I was growing up, my family came down to the Smoky Mountains a lot here in Tennessee. I marked that here on the map, too. Um, have any of you, this is kind of a long shot, have any of you ever been to the Smoky Mountains or Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge, Tennessee? Okay. It's, um, it's the most visited national park in the country. So like Yellowstone or Yosemite or the Grand Canyon, the Great Smoky Mountains um, have the most people visit by far. So in 2016, when I graduated, I decided that I wanted to move down here because I loved it so much. And I actually started working as a cashier in the park visitor center. So we sell souvenirs and books and all kinds of things. So I did that for a couple of years and then I got promoted and I started doing what I do now, which is illustrating and graphic design. And the park has a newspaper and a magazine that I work on. And this book was my very first project. So my boss is the author and I was the illustrator. And we just, we started this during um, lockdown last year and we just finished it in January or so. So it came out this spring. And um, like I said, I've been doing this, oops been doing this for about five years, so I'm relatively new, but um, I have some stuff I can share with you about how I draw, and I hope that it helps you guys a little bit. So um, I don't know how familiar you are with this book. I know that the library has had it for maybe a couple months now. Does that sound right? Okay. Um, so just to briefly tell you about it, it's roughly a fifth grade level. So um, I don't know, when I was younger, I was reading a little bit ahead of my age. So um, I'm not sure what kind of books you guys are reading right now, but Sean, it's definitely something you could read. Um, it starts with a, a fictional story. Oh, go ahead. Do you have a question? I can read it. I'm on like level 15, 20 or something or 15. Okay, Probably well, great. Um, it's, uh, it's a fictional story in the beginning, and then the back talks a little bit about, you know, how these animals act in real life, and then also um, how people have built crossing structures to help them cross roads. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, most of the story is, it's um, focusing on this group of animals who uh, have lived in this sort of mountainous area for a long time. And they've always crossed freely across the river to find food and shelter and mates until um, a big highway was built. And so it's based on a real life area here in the Smoky Mountains where there's a big interstate that was built. And people are seeing a lot of um, bears and deer and elk get hit by cars. And so it's gotten to be a really serious problem. Um, but this book talks about these characters and how they sort of band together to find a way to cross. So um, there's all these illustrations in the book as well. And I've shown you a couple here and later I'll show you how I did these. Um, this is the part of the book in the back that shows you the real life animals and talks about how they behave. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen out in like the snow or the mud animal tracks. Um, so this part of the book, go ahead. <laughs> you might still I, have, I have seen animal tracks before. Do you know what kind they were? 
They were like a beaver or an elk or a deer. I don't I don't know what kind they were. They were Did like, they look kind of like that one on the left, like a hoof? Yeah, they looked like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's lots of deer in Michigan. So I didn't know which one it was because they all like have the same one. Yeah. So, like, well, the, the elk have huge footprints, and I think maybe they're only in like the northern parts of Michigan. And I saw turkey footprints in my backyard because there's a turkey in my backyard. Oh, yeah. I see turkeys all the time. Wild ones. So um, the next part in the back of the book is about these different crossing structures. And a lot of these have already been built out west or in different countries. And so um, part of this movement that the book is supporting wants to um, build more of these structures out here in the east. And so it kind of talks about the different types and how they're appropriate for different animals and that kind of thing. So this sort of, in a nutshell, is why we published this book. And this is a video I'm going to play. Come on, baby. Come on, keep going. There we go. <laughs> so this is Interstate 40, and this is actually a really long interstate that runs um, all the way from the East Coast out to California. And this is part of it here in Tennessee and North Carolina. And you can see here in the video that um, there's this big concrete barrier in the middle of the highway, and that makes it really hard. I mean, this mama bear can get over it okay, but look at how much her babies. Uh, <laughs> you know, have to struggle to climb over it. And it totally brought traffic to a standstill. And this crossing was successful, um, but not all of them are, and that's the problem. And so just really quick, I mean, this is getting into the numbers, but one to two million large mammals are killed a year, $12 billion in property damage, so cars, um, 26,000 injuries and 200 human fatalities annually. And it costs a lot. I don't know if you guys have ever hit a deer or anything like that when you've been driving with your family, but it can be fatal to the deer and it can be really dangerous to people too. And elk are just that much bigger. So here where we have elk, it's even, you know, more damaging and more costly. So the good news is um, there's this coalition of organizations that have come together and they've started to do something about it. So it's sort of hard to see, but in this picture on the right, that's a trail camera. And they've been, for the past couple of years, collecting all of these images of wildlife that live in the area so they can figure out, you know, how do these animals behave around the road? Does it change their behavior? Where do they try to cross? You know, that's going to help them figure out how to work with the state departments of transportation to um, build these sort of things. And departments of transportation have to do repairs on roads all the time, right? There's always some kind of construction going on. So they hope that while they're doing that, they can get them to build the kind of things that will help animals get across more safely and make it safer for drivers. So I just wanna show a couple of these um, trail camera images and videos with you. So this is a bobcat mother and you can see she's got her kitten with her here. And this is called a culvert, this big round metal thing. And they actually built this under the road to move the water underneath. But what this shows is that animals will use anything available to them to cross the road safely. And it shows that they're capable of teaching their babies how to use them too. So this culvert actually inspired a part of the book that I'll show you later. Um, this is a bear near the highway. It's sort of hard to see, but the highway is right down this hill. And um, you can see he's sort of pacing back and forth. And what they've discovered is that bears show very stressful behavior or stressed out behavior, probably because they have really strong senses of smell. They can actually smell um, a lot better than your dog and they can smell like a granola bar about a mile away. So all of this exhaust and gasoline fumes that are coming up off the highway, they're really stressing him out and he has to make a decision now about whether he's gonna take the risk to cross this highway. Um, so I mentioned a minute ago that that culvert with the bobcats that inspired a scene that uh, the author of the book wrote about the coyote and the bobcat working together. And in the book, they call it the black hole. And this is one of the ways they figured out they can get across that highway safely by going underneath it. 
And then on the right here, um, this is some natural bear behavior that I wanted to get in the book. This is called a scratch tree. And I don't know if you've ever seen a video of a bear, but they like to rub their back up and down on the tree. And that's how they communicate with other bears like, hey, I've been here or this is my turf or that kind of thing. So I wanted to have that in the book too. Um, in the beginning of the book, I have a map. And that was really important to me because a lot of the books that I read when I was younger, like the Redwall series or, you know, Lord of the Rings, um, they have these big maps in the beginning. And I think that's really cool because as you're reading, you can sort of refer to this map to figure out where the characters are and where they're going. And this isn't a perfect representation of the real life Pigeon River Gorge, but it's pretty close. I got the real thing on the right here. And it's got the river and the road and sort of the rolling mountains. So it's, it's pretty faithful to the real life place. Um, and then finally, the real life highway, they actually blasted a tunnel through this mountain for traffic to move through. And what that did is it actually created an accidental land bridge over top of the highway. And so they've put up the, those trail cameras and they have seen that animals will actually use this to get across the highway as well. But this is only one very small area of that kind of long 28 mile stretch through the mountains. And so they want to have other structures, you know, staggered throughout that animals can use. But in the book, this is um, the final scene where they discover this land bridge in the story. Just to show you a couple of things that they've already done in other places that were really successful. This is in Canada and um, they built this overpass. And what's great is that they planted everything on top of it so it feels more natural to the animals. Um, some of the problems with the culvert that I showed you earlier is that it feels really dark and the animals can feel really um, contained or they don't wanna go in there because they feel trapped. So this is a great solution because pretty much every type of animal will use it. And it can be expensive, but it can also be one of the most successful ways that we can help animals cross safely. Um, just a couple other kinds, and these are all in the book too, but when there's not a lot of money for a project, or maybe it's just the very beginning of it, these signs can be helpful. Um, you've probably seen like the road signs with the deer silhouette that kind of lets you know like, hey, deer are in this area, but it might not be enough to, you know, prevent someone from hitting a deer. So these are just a couple of different options. Okay, so that's the end of my, um, my talk, and now I will get into the actual drawing part. So I draw in um, a program called Adobe Photoshop on my computer, but it's by no means the only program. Um, have any of you ever like drawn on an iPad or anything like that? Okay, all of you, that's awesome. Um, I have an iPad too and a program called Procreate that I really like. It's, um, I think it's about $10. Um, if you're interested in drawing, that's something I would definitely check out or have your parents check out because it's a great program. Um, this is sort of like a more professional program that I use on a day-to-day -day basis, but a lot of what I'm going to show you is pretty widely applicable. So I'm just going to... Uh, sort of walk you through how I did this illustration from the book. This is the scene where um, our main black bear character meets another black bear, but she's brown colored because um, black bears come in a few different colors. So this is that scene in the book. And on the right side here, I'm gonna keep my reference photos. I almost always draw from photos because I don't, I'm not able to keep all of that information in my memory. And drawing from your memory is really fun, but when you wanna draw something that looks like it does in real life, I always recommend looking at a photo or even if like you're able to go to the zoo or something, drawing the animals you know, as they're laying around is really fun. And it really helps you build your knowledge of you know, how those animals behave and sort of their proportions, their body parts. It's just really good practice. Um, one of the things we do in art school is we do a lot of life drawing of, of human models. So they'll hold a pose for us and then we draw them for a while. So anyway, um, in my drawing program, I know this looks really overwhelming like this interface, but 
I'll try to just break it down to the simplest parts. So one of the really cool things about drawing digitally is that, and there's gonna be a little bit of a lag because I'm sharing my screen, so I'm sorry. But one of the really cool things about drawing digitally is that if I draw something and I decide that I don't like where it is on the page, I can just move it around super simply. Um, or if I decide that I want it to be smaller or, you know, in a different sort of orientation. Don't know why it's skewing it like that. I want to just resize it, but anyway. There's a lot of really nice um, features of drawing on a computer that you wouldn't have on paper. And it's drawing on paper is great too. I mean, that's what I did a lot when I was younger. I didn't get one of these drawing tablets until I was about 12. So I definitely learned how to draw a lot on paper first. But anyway, so I knew when I was thinking about this scene in the book, I knew that um, Bear was sort of pursuing She-Bear through the forest. And I knew that I wanted it to be sort of like this dappled light coming through the trees. Um, and sometimes drawing a whole background in a whole scene is really intimidating. So it's totally fine to just start with like, you know, one character or something. I'm just gonna be showing you the whole process. So I'm gonna go back to my picture of that bear. And I just found this, you know, I searched on Google like bear running or something like that. It's really good to pick a photo that you can see all the parts of it really clearly. Um, this isn't a great example because her feet are sort of hidden here, but I've drawn bears enough to sort of have a rough idea of what their feet look like. So I just kind of, I drew that part from my memory, but when you're starting, if you're able to find a photo that's really clear, that's the best. So I'm just gonna sort of roughly sketch in. I almost always start with a circle for the head. Um, and I'll go back in later and I'll, you know, refine this, but this is just my early sketch and I'm gonna get her ears in here. And I'm gonna sort of block in her muzzle shape. And in the book, I had sort of a more cartoony style. Um, a lot of artists, something they worry about a lot is, you know, developing their style. And what I would suggest is that you start by just, um, imitating photos as closely as you can. Not that you have to do that, but if you're interested in, you know, learning how to draw people or animals realistically, once you have a really good foundational knowledge of sort of what their proportions are, it's easier to work from that. And then you can start to stylize things. You can say, well, in this drawing, you know, their eyes are gonna be a little bit bigger. In this book, I did sort of want them to be a little bit more cartoony because I wanted them to be really expressive. Um, I find that it's easier to relate, um, especially like that's why we tend to like animals like cats and dogs and bears because they they make expressions that are really similar to people. Do you have a question? Okay, <laughs> well, you can ask questions anytime while I'm drawing. I'm just gonna be sort of casually chatting through this while I draw. Um, so I've sort of put in her eyes here. I'm not really happy with where I put her eyes, but I can always go back and fix this. And another awesome thing about drawing digitally is that you have your undo button. So I have a keyboard shortcut for it, but you know, it's in the menu too, the undo brush tool. So it's like an instant eraser and these are real luxuries that sometimes I wish I had while I was drawing on paper or painting or whatever. So the other cool thing about working digitally is that, you know, when you're drawing on paper or you're painting or something, your medium is graphite or, you know, acrylic paint or something like that. When you're working digitally, what you're basically doing is you're putting down itty bitty pixels. 
And so what that means is that um, you can make these bigger or smaller as much as you want. You have to be a little careful because if you make them bigger than they originally were, the computer has to make up some of that information. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, when you enlarge it, you're basically asking the computer to like fill in some of those spaces you've created, which means that things can look kind of fuzzy. That's why if you have a picture and you try to make it a lot bigger, it's gonna look sort of fuzzy. So that's just one thing you have to keep in mind when you're working digitally. But I'm gonna finish um, working on her body here. And I need to just get a little bit looser because this isn't gonna be the final version. It's just sort of me blocking in her proportions. And she's got sort of this hump on her back. I apologize because it is lagging a little bit on my end, um, which will make this a little bit harder, but you can get the gist of it. So one of the things that makes this pose challenging is that she's sort of running towards us. So the front half of her body is closer to us and the back half of her body is further away. And that's called foreshortening. Um, what that means is that the, her back legs are gonna appear smaller than they would normally. And so, in fact, I think I've made them a little bit too big, so I'm gonna select them and I'm gonna resize. And I think maybe her head is a little bit too big too. Um, I know this is a lot to take in and I'm not explaining a lot about like what specific tools I'm using in the program. Um, if any of you are really interested in this, I can provide some great resources about sort of how I learned to use these programs. And that one I mentioned earlier, Procreate on the iPad, it's really similar to Photoshop. So um, you'll find that doing this in Procreate would be pretty similar to what I'm doing right now. If any of you guys want to tell me about, you know, if you make art right now, how you normally, what sort of materials you use and what you like to draw, please feel free. And you don't have to stay muted. You know, I would love to just have a conversation while I'm doing this. Or if you just want to watch, that's fine too. <laughs> So even though I can't really see them in my photo, I'm sort of starting to put in her toes um, just because I sort of know roughly. Uh, bears have five toes on their front feet. Yeah, I think in my, yep, five, five toes on their front feet and their back feet. And those are the kind of details that I pay attention to to make sure that um, these look realistic as possible in the end. So I'm gonna move her eye a little bit because I don't think I got the placement of that quite right. Okay, that's better. All right, so now I have her sort of roughly where I want her on the page. And I'm gonna put in our other bear character. And I've got my photo of him right here. And normally what I do is I keep the page that I'm drawing on up on one side and my photos on the other. And that's really easy to do in real life too. If you have like a, if you have it pulled up on your computer screen or you have it on your phone or you even have like a printout, those are all things that you can do. Okay, so I know that I want him to be sort of watching her run away in the background and he's gonna be a lot smaller because like I said earlier, he's further away from us. So he's gonna be a lot smaller on the page. And I won't be able to get into the same level of detail on him. But I'm gonna do the same thing. Black bears have really tall ears. That's one of the ways you can tell them apart from grizzly bears or brown bears is that they have these big tall ears whereas grizzlies are sort of short and squat. Okay, 
So I'm gonna get his nose in here and he's sort of, he's pretty big and bulky. Um, the, the male black bears tend to be heavier and stockier. And I can't see his feet either. So I'm just gonna sort of sketch these in. I know when Sean and Jimmy and I were talking a little bit earlier, um, they had, I think Jimmy had mentioned that maybe he was going to try drawing along. Jimmy, are you drawing while we're doing this? Or are you just watching? I see a pencil. He's got it. All right. We'll love to see if you want to share your drawing when you're done. We would love to see it if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Pencil. Okay, so I actually feel like he's a little bit big because he's going to be on this sort of path. I don't want to do that. There we go. Okay, and I'm not really committed to where they are because I can always move them around. And that's a big part of the process for me is that I will move things around a lot as I'm sort of um, putting in the background and working digitally just makes it so easy to make these changes on the fly. It's really nice. So in the, uh, the final version, I sort of had this path and I knew that one of the things I wanted to do to kind of create the feeling of space in the drawing, like to feel like this forest really goes back is to um, show some of these trees you know, I've got this tree next to her that's really big. It's cropped out of the picture a little bit. And that makes us feel like it's, again, closer to us. So I'm just going to sort of sketch that in here. And then I've got another, like, log in the bottom right corner. And when things are closer to us, they're also, we can see a lot more detail. So on this plant in the front, it's a, um, a pipe vine is what it's called. Um, I really wanted to make sure that I got the shapes of these leaves in here. These sort of heart-shaped leaves. And then they've got these sort of vine tendrils that come down. But again, right now I'm just sketching. Um, I'm just sort of trying to put everything in its place and get the proportions roughly correct. And then I will come back and refine it later. And this was a, you know, this is a really time consuming illustration. There were a lot of different parts of it. But when I drew when I was younger, I would probably just draw like a single bear. Um, you know, it's kind of up to you how far you feel like completing a drawing. There's, there's never any, you know, it's always up to you. It's always up to you about how long you're enjoying it. And if you are drawing something and you find that you're just not happy with it or you don't like it, I find that it's just best to leave it and start a new drawing later. But if you're really happy with something and you want to kind of see it, you know, push to its full potential and you really want to keep working on it, it can be really fun to add a background and add other elements. So it's all just up to you. Um, I've got this other tree in the background and then I sort of had some bushes and these bushes kind of help define the shape of this path. And then I had some footprints in here because I was sort of imagining that this was like soft mud. And I think the book talks about the footprints she leaves too. That's basically um, what an illustrator does is they have to read the text really carefully and then they have to draw exactly what's in the text. So sometimes they're sort of room for interpretation, like um, editorial illustrators work on magazine pieces, and they sort of have a little bit more freedom to decide, okay, what sort of drawing is going to work best with this text. But usually in a story like this, it will be a very literal depiction of what exactly is happening in the story. So I had some trees back here that were a little bit further away. And these are just the parts um, of the line drawing, so the shapes. And I'm going to talk a little bit more when I start coloring about how I use 
color and value to um, help create this scene as well. So at this point, I pretty much have all of the elements sketched in. Um, it's not a perfect creation of the original, but I'm sort of working fast here. This took a lot longer when I did the real thing. Mm -hmm. um, I had some other references that I used, just sort of some of this foliage. Um, and one of the things I do when I'm drawing plant life like this is that, you know, I said earlier that I had all these individual leaves in this log because they're really close to us. But when it comes to the background, I don't worry a lot about every single individual leaf. I just sort of try to get the shape in here. Um, it's a lot more important with things that are far away from us to just get these uh, colors and values right. And when I say values, what I mean is how light or dark they are. So where I have the light kind of falling through the forest here, these are lighter values. And where the light isn't really hitting, like back here in the trees, these are darker values. So those end up being really important decisions I have to make. Um, that are going to make it look more like a three-dimensional space. So, okay. I don't have any eyes on him yet, but there we go. So now that I've got my rough sketch, I would probably start putting some very basic colors down. And the other cool thing about working digitally is that I have these layers. I don't know how well you can see them here in my program. I have layers and what that means is that I've got my white background at the very bottom and then I have my black lines that I just drew and I'm able to actually isolate those. So what that means is that I can make a new layer between the two and then I can get a color and I'm gonna make my brush a lot bigger here. Um, Photoshop has all these different brushes you can use and some of them are really basic and some of them have a little bit more texture. And this is the one that I use a lot. That's sort of a sponge brush. And what's really neat about it is that my tablet is pressure sensitive and it's the same thing with the Apple Pencil and the iPad and everything. That if I make a really light, gentle stroke it shows up as a very light stroke on the screen as well. So what that lets me do, and this depends on the brush you're using, is that I can get sort of a blended effect like you could with real life, um, especially like oil paints sort of behave like this. So that's a really important thing that helps me get these kind of lifelike textures and blending. So anyway, I'm going to start, um, they call it blocking in when you're just putting your colors down and you're trying to figure out, okay, what parts of the drawing are going to be darkest and what parts are going to be lightest. So I'm actually going to start with some of my dark areas. And everything that they taught me back when I was in school is to always start with your darkest areas because they they kind of set the tone. They help you figure out how light and dark everything is going to be in relation to those. So I'm going to just start with this dark green color. And this is going to be where, um, where the light isn't reaching that part of the forest very much. And then I also want sort of a dark brown color up here in the front, and this is sort of where the dirt is on this path. And the light is kind of coming down through the leaves, and so it's making these little sort of splotches of light. And this is really difficult to do. Um, I was feeling pretty ambitious with this drawing, and I decided that I wanted to have this kind of lighting. But usually, if you ever want to, you know, study lighting, a really simple way to start is just by having like a, a simple shape, like a, a ball or a cone, and then having like sort of a, a desk light on it. And then you can really see, you know, how light tends to interact on objects. This, you know, this sort of painting light knowledge took 
so many years of practice. And um, that's not meant to be intimidating. I don't want it to sound that way. But what it means is that you just have to spend a lot of years looking at things. Ooh, I want to see that. Can you hold it up a little? Oh, I should make it bigger on my screen too. Oh, Jimmy, look at that. Ooh, is that the bear in the front? That's really cool. Oh my gosh. Luke did one too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Luke, wow, look at you guys. That is awesome. We have some artists here. I did one too. Ooh, nice. I really nice. want to see these. Um, I want to see them bigger if we can upload these pictures anywhere. If we can, I, I can, um, we can post them on the, on the, uh, on Facebook. Yeah. I mean, you're the, you're the librarian, so it's up to you, but. <laughs> yeah. If you guys want to take a photo of it with their digital cameras, maybe I will, you know what I'll do is I'm going to have a post come out that has, um, the link information to this video. Okay. And so maybe I'll say in the comment section, if you were able to draw a picture to post them in the comments, how about that? You guys, that would be pretty cool awesome. to share them. I can't wait yeah. to see them bigger. They're really small on my screen right now. Yeah. Um, so we'll right we'll now, do that for sure. When we get the social media post out. Cool. So right now, um, what's the social yeah. media post? That means on Facebook, that means on Facebook, I'm going to put out a little advertisement because we're recording this so that other people who couldn't join us live can watch it. And if you guys have, if you find our Facebook um, post on it in the comment section, you can post a picture of your drawing. I can't and wait. That's, a, that's a really good way for us to share it and be able to see it. That way we can make it bigger and see it. Cool. So um, usually when I'm putting down color, I'll start making additional layers and that way I can keep them separate. And that makes it really easy for me if I have to change the color of something because they're isolated. Um, but anyway, I'm just gonna keep sort of roughly blocking this all in. And I hope, you know, I apologize for the fact that some of this is pretty complex. Um, I hope that it's useful even if you're not working digitally or you know if you're just drawing something simple well i'm thinking that even if you're doing something with like watercolor paints or with chalk or any kind of a, a different medium where you can blend colors and things it would be really fun to experiment with blending them and seeing yeah absolutely that's one of my favorite parts is um i really like picking out colors and sort of you know when um when I was younger, I did a lot of artwork where I thought, you know, oh, well, the grass is green and the sky is blue. So these are always the colors I'll pick. Um, but if you go outside and you pay attention, you'll see that sometimes the sky is, you know, different shades of blue or it's even pink. And sometimes when it's close to night, the grass is actually sort of dark blue. I mean, it's, it's really hard to wrap your head around some of this stuff, but it can really help you start to do more interesting and realistic scenes. Yeah, I think even as beginning artists, we can all benefit from playing around with color like that. Yeah. So I'm gonna do a couple more of these trees back here. And the other thing that helps um, show that things that for are further away from us is that there isn't as much contrast so what I mean by that is that this tree in the front here, it's really dark and what's behind it is a pretty light green. And so it's really stark. Whereas back here, these trees that we can't see very well, it's sort of murky, right? Like the trees are, and the background are sort of a, a middle tone, green and brown. So that helps us see that they're further away from us. And I'm just going to keep working on these bushes. And I'm sort of just doing a simplified version of this because we don't have a ton of time. So <laughs> bear with me. No pun intended. Um, another thing, I'm going to actually start putting in some color on the bear now. The bears. I'm going to make a new layer for that.
So in this scene, um, it's really helpful when you're gonna do a big scene like this to figure out in the very beginning where the light is coming from. And so in this one, I'm just gonna put a little yellow dot where it is coming from and that's sort of this top corner and it's sort of filtering down through and it's hitting the ground really brightly right here. It's hitting the side of the, um, the male black bear and it's hitting the very back of the female black bear as she's running further into the foreground. I'll turn that off. I'm going to finish coloring her. And really, when I first did this, it took a lot of trial and error. You know, I had to figure this all out and I erased stuff and I, you know, tried different things. Now it's easy for me to do this because I'm basically looking at the one that I already did, but um, okay, I'm gonna get this sort of ground in. Oops, that's really light. This is the part that I wanna do right here. And if you guys have any questions while I'm doing this, feel free. And I'm, um, I'm also using my eyedropper tool to just grab colors from the finished piece. But when I was making this, I sort of had to make a bunch of decisions about what colors I was going to use. And Jim, go ahead. I was going to say, it looks like Jimmy has a question. You want to unmute Jimmy? Yeah. Um, I did like um, two, like two, I did two shades of yellow. So it would look nice and bright. Cool. Yeah, and sometimes when you're using like markers or paints, um, yeah. your colors feel sort of limited because they don't give you a lot, but you can usually blend them together. Yeah, it feels like when you're using like a yellow Sharpie or something, it feels weird on your hand because it, it's like touching paper and it feels like weird because you drag it. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to blend with Sharpies, that's for sure. It will bleed right through. <laughs> Hey, you guys, did you ever see the blendable markers? I know that I've, I've seen markers that you actually can do some blending with. They're kind of cool. Yeah, and there's such thing as um, markers that can't um, be um, like, um, like that cannot be like, um, that cannot go through paper. Some of them can't, some of them can. <laughs> like I the remember, ones that are like small and fat, the small ones and fat ones. Not like the normal Crayola ones that preschoolers use. The mm -hmm. other ones that are not um, bleedable, like that ble mm -hmm. bleeds through your paper. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do that. Cool. So these leaves on the front here, um, one of the things I can show you is that even though they seem pretty light colored to us, if I open up my colors panel, you can see that they're actually relatively dark. And that's because they're in this foreground part of the scene where the light isn't really hitting them that much. So even though they're lighter than the log that they're on, relatively speaking, they're actually pretty dark. And it's really hard to train your brain to think like this <laughs> um, because our eyes trick us a lot, you know? I don't know if you've seen any optical illusions about colors, but they're always really fascinating. And I'm just very briefly trying to get in some of these kind of dappled shadows underneath her. And I just wanted to get some, some shapes that feel sort of blurry around the edges because the light is coming from really far away. So the further away light is, um, the more blurry shadows are gonna be. If you have a light that's really close to something, that shadow is gonna be really sharp on the edges. just kind of blending in where the, uh, the light is strongest here on the path. And I need to get this lighter black bear colored. And where the light is hitting him, he's actually sort of a brown color because 
Do any of you guys have like a black cat or a black dog? Hi. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever noticed that when sunlight is on him, he actually looks kind of brown? Maybe you haven't, but <laughs> look closer next time and you might see that. Okay. So now I have my colors pretty roughly blocked in. It's a pretty, uh, pretty quick and dirty job, but. Now what I would normally do, um, I need to get some better lighting on her real quick. Sort of this warm, um, warm orange color. Sunlight, if you're outside, sunlight tends to have kind of a yellow cast to it. Um, if you're inside, fluorescent lighting isn't quite that yellow. And so it tends to be more of like a flat white. But when I am showing light you that's put yellow on the bear on, on accident i think you put yellow on the bear on accident this yeah it's, it's not quite the right color but it's sort of um part of that is because i didn't get her original color quite right there oh. we go so it's sort of an orangey brown um and that's because like i was like saying like, like an tan. amber yeah And that's because the light from the sun is um, gonna give everything a sort of yellow cast. And I'm exaggerating a little bit too, um, just because it's a, an illustration for a book and I wanted it to be a little bit more dramatic. So anyway, this is roughly all of the colors that I'm gonna use. Her face is kind of in shadow up here because she's running into the darker part of the forest, but Normally what I would do now that I have all my colors in is um, I would go back to a black and I would get a more, um, a more defined brush. And I would actually start making a more, um, actually gotta turn my colors off for this so I can see it better. I would start making a more refined outline and I would sort of fix any of the errors that I had made while sketching. And you can see on my original that it's a little bit more, um, that I have some really smooth and sort of final looking lines, but I'm not gonna do that right now. And then also what I would do is I would go over top of my lines in the background and I would make it more of like a, a painted scene. Sorry, my camera is right in the way of everything that I'm trying to get you to look at. But so you can see in the final that I don't really have my lines anymore. And that's just a choice that I wanted to make with these illustrations is I wanted the characters to be outlined so that they stood out. But I wanted the background to feel more like a, a painted scene. Um, because in real life, there's no lines around everything. But that's totally a personal choice. Um, sometimes I do illustrations where everything is painted and there's no outlines. Sometimes I do illustrations where everything is outlined and it really feels like a cartoon. That's just, you know, it just depends on what, what you're doing it for. But these are really um, professional questions that I was asking because I was thinking about, okay, what kind of book is this gonna be? And maybe in the future, if you find that you're doing a project for something, um, you might think about how cartoony you want it to be or how realistic you want it to be, but you can also just have fun with it. So um, that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. I mean, if you want to see how I would sort of go about painting this background, mm -hmm. it basically would just be that I would make a new layer and I would get my painting brush back and I would just start going over those lines. And that's when I really have to start paying attention to how those colors are interacting with each other because, you know, right now I'm sort of losing this light green with the yellow behind it. So in the final, I had a bit of a darker brown, but this was a really complex illustration. And I guess at this point, uh, wow, it's already been 52 minutes. <laughs> um, if you guys have any questions, this is, uh, I'd be really happy to answer anything about this drawing or anything about the book or whatever's on your mind.
What do you think, guys? Anything that you are are wondering about or need to ask? That was amazing. Oh. <laughs> I'll just keep this up like this. So I, I agree that. with Jimmy. I thought that was very fascinating. I think we are all set then, Emma. Thanks again. Thank you for having me.